<laughs> Hello, we're here with Sarah Nelson, who's running for Seattle City Council, position nine. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. My name is Sarah, and I am a progressive small business owner running for city council because I believe that Seattle is going in the wrong direction, and I'll bring practical, experienced leadership that's needed right now. I worked for council member Richard Conlin as a legislative aide for about 10 years, so I know how local government should work. And my husband and I started Fremont Brewing about 11 years ago. And I'm proud of our reputation for giving back to our community and leading the craft beer industry in sustainability and also doing right by our employees. We offer extensive benefits like paid family leave and uh, matching 401k plan healthcare that we extend to their families. And we managed not to lay anybody off during COVID. In fact, we kept everyone on and increased their hourly wages because um, they lost tips. So that's what I mean when I say that I'm a progressive small business owner. I lead with the values that are shared by the vast majority of Seattleites and I get things done. I have three main um, campaign priorities. First off is economic recovery. I don't have to tell you how many businesses have closed. I'm concerned that too many people have lost their jobs and we really need to get down to work on a long-term equitable, inclusive economy, uh, economic recovery, but I'm frankly not seeing seconds. council acting with their new urgency. So economic recovery, basic services, getting back to the main job of local government and also rebuilding trust through transparent and honest leadership. Great, thank you. Um, so now we'll move into the four prepared questions. And again, the responses are uh, two minutes in length. And we'll go with this order, Jeff, Sarah, Barbara, and then Mary Kylie. So uh, Jeff, would you uh, like to uh, ask question one? Absolutely. So what specific actions will you take to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle, both in the short term and the long term? Please address land use, zoning, revenue, regional collaboration, the role of social services, and the role of the police and justice system. All right. I saw this question on the questionnaire. So first thing we have to do is stop talking about our homeless neighbors as a monolithic block, because these are individuals that have uh, gotten into the situation that they're in for very many different varied reasons, like fleeing domestic abuse or simply losing their job and losing a paycheck and losing an apartment to mental health and substance abuse disorder. So we really have to focus on understanding who is living unsheltered in our city and meeting those needs. So um, that's the first approach to take. And I believe that Seattle's uh, response has to be completely restructured because we keep spending more and more money and the problem is getting worse. So that will require not just better understanding, but better uh, coordination with uh, various agencies and making sure that they're living up to benchmarks. In the short term, we do have to offer people a place to go so they're not sleeping in the cold, in the rain, in tents, and that they actually have a, a pathway to stable um, housing. So uh, that is the short term. In the long term, I am a big proponent of permanent supportive housing, and that will require land use changes and some building code changes to bring those units online faster. But that is, uh, that is something that is necessary. In, before that happens, I support tiny home villages, vouchers for hotel rooms, whatever uh, immediate relief that we can provide people. A missing piece of the homelessness problem is seconds. jobs. Um, you know, people, uh, that's where the perspective of a small business owner comes in, apprenticeships, workforce development, actually building up our, um, our capacity to offer people and, and create career pathways. And then finally, mental health and substance abuse disorder dollars. Right now, the city does not control the, uh, the dollars for that. That's at the county. I support the, regionally, the Regional Homelessness Authority. I am anxious for it to get up and running because other cities have got to pitch in and they can't keep passing laws saying that, the, that people can't sleep outside while they're not providing shelter. So it's gonna take a regional approach. Okay. And, uh, and there you. we go. Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll ask follow-up a little bit later as well. Um, so uh, let's see. 
Question number two is Sarah. What is your strategy for creating dense and diverse neighborhoods and assuring affordable housing? How would you work to dismantle systemic racist arrangements like redlining, including but not limited to exclusionary zoning and land use policies? Do you support and would you sponsor city legislation to end single family zoning as Berkeley, California recently did? Thank you for that question. Um, so we're living with the legacy of, of exclusionary zoning and uh, the, the best way that I can think of is through policies that reduce or um, inhibit displacement. There, I have a number of different reasons for that that I don't have time to get into, but I'm happy to address that later. So uh, we need to help people stay living where they're living and that uh, does touch on um, development uh, that we have to encourage new development to make it, a, make it possible for people to stay here. We've got to build more housing first and foremost. We have to retain existing affordable housing. So uh, make sure that the that naturally affordable housing that are on the market, you know, 60% of renters live in, 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 um, in, in units that are owned by mom and pop landlords. So let's, um, let's retain existing affordable housing and then build more housing through um, making it easier to get permitted and land use changes for to allow for more house multifamily and different zoning. And then also uh, filling in the missing middle townhomes, uh, duplexes, triplexes. I believe that they should be allowed on every corner and um, figuring out ways to uh, make it easier and uh, to finance and build adus and dadus uh, for people who want to um, stay in Seattle, but also want to live in place, uh, aging in place and have their kids live there perhaps seconds. or an adult. So those are all policy positions that I will take, but ultimately, we're not going to be able to subsidize our way completely out of this program, but I do support the multi, the, um, the grand bargain that came forward in, um, in the HALA process. There are 56 other recommendations for uh, housing density, and I think that our first um, our first responsibility is to revisit those recommendations and, and get going to fulfilling the rest of them. Great, thank you. Uh, question number three, Barbara. Sarah, uh, would you decrease the Seattle Police Department um, SPD, but the bu SPD budget, and if so, approximately by what percentage? And what is your plan for the city's SPOG negotiations? Do you support and will you advocate for ending uh, qualified immunity for law enforcement? I, I'll take the, the last part first, otherwise I'll forget to answer it like the last question. Um, yes, I do support that. So uh, I'll just get, I'll say that right away. Um, I believe that it's possible to have both community safety and responsible law enforcement. And I believe like Carmen Best said, you know, we can have our cake and eat it too. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can keep communities safe and we can have a, uh, uh, police officers that treat the communities that they serve with respect and dignity. That's why I'm not going to, uh, I don't think it's a responsible position to call for a uh, defunding the police or what percentage would I defund the police by? Because right now the, uh, the average time for a priority one 911 response call is 14 minutes. And what if someone were breaking into your mom's house in that amount of time? Bad things can happen. So that's a result of cuts to overtime and, uh, and staffing shortages. And so I think that any candidate does not have a nuanced enough perception or understanding of the police budget to come out and say, let's defund. Our goal should be ensuring that our communities are kept safe and how do we, how do we get there? And good policing, I believe, takes more investment, not less. So uh, I want to make sure that our community police patrols and our crisis intervention team are well equipped to deal with the, with the, the situations that they encounter and also um, are able to respond uh, to people in crisis. So 
So my role, my goal in policing is to um, make, you know, instead of coming out with a slogan, defund by 50% or some percent, I think that we should be focusing on um, making sure that people feel safe. And I do have some ideas about that. I think that police officers should be recruited from the, uh, the neighborhoods that they are patrolling. I call it um, beds and beats. And that will overcome cultural and language barriers and add accountability so that uh, people who, you know, who come in contact with each other tend to treat each other uh, better. And so I think that's something that, that is easy, not easily, but could be implemented. And regarding the contract. Sorry, um, that's time. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I know it's so hard. Uh, we have uh, question number four, and I believe that's Mary Kylie. Yes. <clears throat> so how will you prioritize transportation infrastructure for biking, pedestrians, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars? Which do you view as most important to prioritize funds for? Well, I, um, I read the editorial in the Times. I do believe that we need to fast track or jumpstart uh, our repair and maintenance of bridges because this is about jobs, all right? Transportation infrastructure, our, our bridges bring workers into the city. They allow for the circulation of goods and services, and uh, we cannot afford to fix them later. So I think that it is a prudent um, uh, avenue to pursue bonding for our for bridge maintenance and repair. We shouldn't be in this position that, that we're in right now. There's a maintenance backlog that's going back a long ways. We passed the move Seattle levy and we're still short. So I think that bonding against uh, our, our existing capacity is the right way to go on that. We need to maintain the infrastructure that we have. And I also uh, am a, uh, and I, I also support um, the, the agendas of the bicycle and the pedestrian community because because pedestrian and bike safety is extremely important. My kids ride their bikes to school. I used to ride my bike to downtown. And so this isn't very important too. What, but we've got a bridge in West Seattle that has created an island. And, um, and we can't have any more of that happening in the future. So that is why I think that, uh, you know, in the short term, that that, um, that that kind of infrastructure is, and guess what? This is what the unions that I'm talking to are telling me. The iron exactly. workers say it's really hard to, um, to ride your bike with a bunch of tools to a job site in, in, in Seattle. So, um, so they, so, uh, the, the labor organizations and the building trades that I'm talking to, this is their first priority. And so I'm taking my lead from them. Great, thank you. And uh, let's see, now we're gonna move into our uh, questions from the board, um, follow-up questions. And these responses will be one minute. One minute a piece, yes, Jeff. So you've, you've cited your work with Richard Conlon. I'm wondering what, uh, what part of his legacy you're most proud of or what you think is most relevant to, to Seattle today? Well, legislative wise, I believe that um, our work on uh, recycling and composting was uh, is a lasting legacy. We, we have these mandates right now because of the work that we did. We completely redid the um, solid waste master plan. We eliminated the uh, a third transfer station in Georgetown and we ended up um, you know, implementing ways to reduce the net amount of garbage produced through zero waste principles and also composting and recycling. So that was a big one. What I learned, what, what is a lasting legacy for me though, is understanding how policy should be made. And um, uh, minimizing unintended consequences is, is important because council can pass well-meaning legislation, but without seconds. thinking about the details, and without thinking about um, and without gathering wide range of input, you could end up having negative consequences. So that's one thing that I learned that I will take into office. Thank you. Uh, Sarah. I am a member of the Environmental Caucus in the 36th District and this question comes from them. How would you use your office to address climate change, ensuring a healthy environment and access to climate supporting solutions, such as multimodal clean transportation options for Seattle city residents? 
All right, this is right down my alley because I consider myself the only environmentalist in this race. I've got a long history of um, of work on the uh, in the environment, and I received the uh, the endorsement of Dennis Hayes that I announced on Earth Day. So. Um, I will put the environment back on the city's agenda. That's one thing that uh, that we were really strong in in Richard Conlon's office that has seemed to kind of fall by the wayside. What I will do is is try to accelerate the uh, the climate action plan, which calls for getting to carbon neutrality at, at 2050, but, I, but that should be speeded up. I have a long history of trying to promote um, green technologies and renewable energy sources, such as anaerobic digesters that take solid waste and turn it into 15 seconds. a clean energy solution. And I mean, okay, um, more electrification for, for electric vehicles. And, um, and we can also uh, think about new mandates for the, um, the fleet of, I'm sorry, I'm out. <laughs> ah. <laughs> It's hard. Oh, it is. Uh, They're short. Shoot. I blew my, my best shot. At <laughs> it's OK. Uh, Mackenzie, you're next. Thanks. Yeah, they're tough with just one minute. Um, my question for you is, do you support proposed uh, the proposed Seattle Charter Amendment on homelessness? And uh, what would you change anything about that at all? I support the principle of getting uh, getting a building capacity and directing funding for mental health and uh, and substance abuse disorder. I, I said earlier that I support the regional homelessness authority, but um, we need to do something right now. So I appreciate and think that that is the right focus for this uh, this initiative, and it also establishes a dedicated funding stream for housing. So these are two incredibly important things, and I'm I'm happy that is being uh, focused on. I have some questions about um, about some of the legality, about whether or not it has to be a charter amendment. To my understanding, these are things that council could do right now. The problem is that they haven't. Well, except for the the funding for behavioral health, which I alluded to before. But in general, I think that the that the money is directed where it needs to go into all different kinds of housing. Um, you know. Uh, rapid rehousing on the way to uh, to permanent supportive housing and getting people the help they need if they're struggling with addiction or mental illness. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Hi, Sarah. So um, when and when you're asking answering question one, um, which was about homelessness, if this is sort of a follow on or a chance to for you to um, Add, add some more to our understanding of, um, I'd let, you said one word that made my ears prick up and you used the word restructure or yes. restructuring. And I'm just wondering if you would clarify what you meant to refer to and what it is you think deserves um, the attention of the council um, to be restructured in order to respond to those problems. Thank you for asking me that. So in addition to having a better understanding of who needs what, um, by restructuring, I was talking about um, right now, let me back up. There are a lot of different service providers that have contracts with the city. They're individual nonprofits and they, and they do different things. Right now, the city doesn't really have, it's, there is not any transparency about um, who is doing what, what are the gaps and what are the overlaps in services? And I, many people read the interview with Jason Johnson in the Seattle Times, I believe it was in February or March. And he was saying that we're contracting over and over again with service providers that are not meeting benchmarks. So when I talk about restructuring, I think that we should have a more, that the city should be a portal so that, um, that individuals can, that there's information among service providers about uh, what services that person needs, has received. Sometimes they just need to get back into Plymouth housing or they they need to, to access a clinic to get back on medication or something like that. But right now there is no structure for information sharing and, and continuity of care. That's what I was meaning when I talked about restructuring. And if we're going to uh, invest in, and we very much should, we should make sure that our dollars are going to, um, to effective solutions. And That's we've time. had models. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, 
Alice, uh, we are at time. Would you? Oh, that's okay. Okay. Nah. Okay. All right. So uh, if you would like, uh, you may go ahead with your one minute uh, wrap up. Okay. I'm not going to take one minute. Uh, basically, um, what I want to say is that there's a lot to be uh, scared and nervous about. I mean, I've lived here for 30 years. I have two kids and a small business. I'm invested in this community and 2020 was the, was the worst and, and uh, toughest year that I can remember. And, um, but I believe that crisis breeds opportunity and we've got a chance for a major reset in the city. And it starts with electing candidates who will be held accountable for delivering measurable results. So I guess my message is um, there's cause for optimism. And there was a lot of creativity displayed when when uh, restaurants shut down and, uh, and permits seconds. were expedited. And we can do that again, harnessing the creativity in this town and delivering on our promises. Great, thank you so and I would much. Love, okay. I would love the endorsement of the 36 Democrats. Great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And I uh, just for the record, earlier in, in one of your responses, you said you had you recognized the question. And I just want to clarify for people who might be watching, these set of questions that we asked are not shared ahead of time, um, but we did pull oh. the King County Democrats questionnaire. Okay. So just a quick clarification. Yeah, no peaky peaky here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you very much.